Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I've really been putting probably, I called it six months into it. I was thinking about it this morning and, uh, initial conversation with like my video team was I'm August, late August. Hey, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to launch the brand. Um, I want to do something more than just update my LinkedIn. Hey, I started a new job. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, big, big splash. And then also utilize my network on platform like LinkedIn that I have built. I've been really intentional about it, building like a good network, not spamming people just to have a follower number or connection number. Yeah. Really be intentional about it. Yep. And, um, and, and pairing that, I was like, I want to do a launch video. I don't see anybody launching a company and then like, yeah, strong convictions proceed great action. This is why I felt called to launch my brand. Let's go. Uh, and so, yeah. And that brand is? Onward. And why did you choose that name? So, uh, growing up, my dad was an entrepreneur. And uh, in the face of adversity, I just always remember my mom saying onward and upward. Um, and so, the highs are high. I mean, you're an entrepreneur, the highs are high, the lows are low. Um, it's it's kind of how you smooth them out over time, and uh, and moving onward like the only the only way. Um, so starting a company, branding, launch video. What are you excited most about? Dude, I'm excited about changing companies with badass executive placements, like dudes that are going to drive business forward, uh, people with 20, 30 years of experience. But then also uh, kind of an ideal profile for a lot of my clients is a guy that's our age, early, mid thirties, investment banking background, spent time in private equity, super sharp, um, and is, is going to be a CFO at 35 and they're going to drive a company that maybe it starts at $0 of revenue and they grow it and they grow that role or they get brought into an organization that's already started. Um, but they need someone really bright, really driven, strategy minded. And uh, a lot of the placements, a lot of the people that I interact with are more of this like finance, corporate development, M and A, like I said, kind of deal deal makers. And um, a lot of executive or a lot of organizations like those guys in executive positions because like they know how to get stuff done. Yep. Um, and they're deal makers and they're strategy minded versus, um, yeah. Hey, just you started as a financial analyst. I started as a financial analyst, so it's like shots on me, but. Um, the guys with the, the deal making background are, are going to accelerate the growth of the company more significantly. So I'm just stoked about like, placing those guys, building relationships. Um, I'm, I'm always down to, to help other people. I love it. So, um, there's a guy, Tim Schur, I read his book, um, the Se secret success society, um, and, and his plain, like plain Jane simple is like, I help other people win. And, uh, so shout out to Tim. And still like, but uh, I'm pretty sure he'd be happy with other people talking about. I love it. Actually. I love it. So you've got the new company starting. You're excited about placing some some really cool people that's in your network in the companies, mergers, acquisitions. Why are you starting this company? So I spent five years working for somebody else, and um, I kind of learned all the things I didn't want to replicate. Okay. And then in, I I had a deep conviction that. I could serve A-level clients and A-level candidates um, in a much better process format. Um, and, and not that there's not a place for the C clients, C candidates, and B clients, B candidates, or companies. I always say clients, I'm talking about companies. Um, but I just have a strong conviction that I want to work with the best. Nice. I consider myself the best. And so I want to work with people that are also at that level. Um, so how did that come about that decision? Um, I think getting exposure to, to A-level clients and A-level candidates and seeing the emotional and intellectual, like quality level that they were all at, um, was inspiring and, and I don't do anything to come in second place. And, and so for me it was, how do I operate at this level with these guys? How do I serve them? Because I'm not going to go into a company and build their financial model or help them, um, you know, buy dental practices or buy orthopedic practices. Um, but I can, I can be a kind of conduit to bring them the talent that does do that. Nice. And then I get to kind of, I get to watch it happen and I get to be a, what I can still consider an integral part to their growth. Um, but not be an employee, be an entrepreneur, do cool stuff, build relationships, nice. uh, get people together, 
create a ton of value, um, which I'm just stoked about, man. How do you put yourself in a position to be around and meet some of these A players and A clients? So you've, you've sounds like your company was more that BC player on both ends. Now you're building your own company to get to those A players. How are you going to go about that? And how are you going to get in to some of those networks and build some of those relationships? Yeah. Um, go to impact events, shout out. <laughs> uh, no, on, honestly, man, I, I think it's just getting really comfortable with, with the reps and and so i tried to network my tail off going to impact events um was, was huge especially kind of as we came out of covid and all the chaos that that ensued from that um i have a voice in the space so i built a personal brand on linkedin that people know like and trust and as, as quick as i can get to that like know like and trust triangle like that's when you capture someone um and, and you can turn them into a client and ideally they're at an a level um but also, so personal brand, I have a pretty strong personal brand, um, being a voice in the space. Uh, I'm pretty involved with leadership healthcare here in Nashville. I lead coffee networking groups for them and, um, and have, have built kind of my brand into that. Um, and then also attending conferences, so like private equity conferences, healthcare conferences, meeting people, building kind of a no like and trust pyramid with them. Uh, also hosting events. So. Um, I'm getting a, a group together on a quarterly basis around cigars and bourbon, and that's what bros, bros and gals, uh, like in that space. Like you cut, what, what do my ideal, what's my ideal client? What do they enjoy? Where do they socialize? Okay, how can I create a space that delivers that value um, to that group of people? And uh, so, yeah, I've got a ticketed event. People pay to come and, um, you know, meet other people in the industry and then they walk away going, Oh my gosh, how did like, how did Travis get all those people in that room? They were awesome. They were intelligent. They were thoughtful. They liked some of the same things I like. I could do work with them. Like I could do business with them. So in that space, you have private equity guys that are deploying capital and then you have investment bankers that are trying to do almost like in a real estate scenario, like either sell side or buy side, they're taking companies to market. So they're taking companies to private equity shops. So if you get those guys in a room, you build their network together, um, then we end up. Yeah, yeah, and, and part of our motto is, um, we win when you win. And I'll win. So, I like it. Yeah, I like it. What are some of the um, struggles or challenges you face kind of going out on your own? Yeah, uh, so right now I'm reading uh, The E-Myth Revisited. Uh, it's been on my reading list for way too long. And uh, I read pretty much every other business book before that. Uh, I wish I, if I could rewind 12 months, I would read that book first. Yeah. Um, Michael Kerber just has like kind of the timeless perspective on being an entrepreneur. And um, I, I started reading it. I had a couple of long conversations with buddies of, of the challenges and struggles and over the just past couple of months. And it was always positive. It was like, I, I've always wanted this, but I'm trying to, develop business, I'm trying to manage my virtual assistant, I'm trying to think about how to build a team. Uh, and Gerber talks about, you go from being a technician, and um, and I was a technician for some for another entrepreneur, right? And then when you step out, um, you're, no, you're also, you're the technician, but then you're the manager, and you're the entrepreneur. Yeah. And, and how do you avoid, and I think even honestly before I read that book, or started reading that book, um, I think I always saw myself as the technician for the next five years as I build it. Um, now I'm thinking, how do I get out of being the technician in six to 12 months? And how am I the entrepreneur, casting vision, leading, and then how do I bring technicians in? Yeah. Um, and how do I find someone that's a good manager and uh, work on the business, not in the business? And um, dude, that's been eye opening. Yeah. Super eye opening. Yeah. So it's uh, understanding the role and understanding the progression and understanding the paths that you're on. and, and in, figuring out how to build a vision and then work it backwards yeah right? and sometimes we don't even realize well my vision for the next 12 months has me stagnant here as the technician as the doer as the talent yeah where your talent is is the leadership and although you can probably do it better than someone you may bring in to do some headhunting or recruiting or whatnot you are still overseeing that process and making sure you're dialed into it, but you don't actually have to go do all the mundane tasks that are needed day to day, yeah. week to week. And I mean, I think that's one of the biggest struggles with entrepreneurs. You know, 
when I talk to people in our groups, our community, and um, even some folks in our mastermind, the biggest struggle is they're wearing all the hats. Yeah. Well, I get that, but what's the plan to get out of that? Yeah. Well, I don't know. And it's like, well, we need to find out. Yeah. So where do you want to be in 12 months? How are you going to get there, reverse engineer it back, and then start filling in those gaps? And what it usually comes down to is systems, processes, and talent, yeah. right? So you build a system, you now leverage that system to new talent, you grow that leader into someone that you can give more responsibility, but you're still overarching, seeing down the process, and then you really should be moving into a sales role. Yeah. And then how do you hire the salesperson? Once yeah. you've accomplished the sales system, yeah. right? And you know, from the consulting stuff that I've been working on, what I'm realizing is the leader is, in a, in a lot of businesses, not all, but that leader thinks they're here mm -hmm. and they're still the top salesperson. Yes. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's great. You're the VP of sales and the CEO. Yeah. But we got to realize that we're the VP of sales and the CEO. Yeah. We're not just the CEO. Yeah. Right. And you know, then you go into some of those smaller businesses or not smaller businesses from a revenue standpoint, but smaller businesses from a team standpoint. And people go, well, it's, you know, I, I, I am the talent, right? I have to do that. I have to be the technician. Yeah. And in some cases you should be, but how do you push position yourself as the technician for marketing or the face of the business, not necessarily the day to day work Yeah. but yeah. while still overseeing it. Right. So it's that complex mix of like, I'm here and really focus on what, where are you actually, and where do you actually want to go and how are you going to actually get there? Yeah. And I think that's the most skip step in entrepreneurship because it's like, and then, then you have some people who just, Hey, I'm a solopreneur and I just want, you know, two VAs and you know, a marketing machine that works yeah. like that works, but there is a point where you can't, you, you max out, right? We all think in entrepreneurship, there's no ceiling. Yeah. There is a ceiling for a solopreneur. Yeah. It's the process is peace and working backwards. Um, yeah, I mean, there's in, in the organization I've been in, in the past uh, or was in for about five years, there's no vision. And, um, and I think it's like, I think there's like scripture out there, like but there's no vision that people like fail or, or whatnot. Um, I know that that's either a quote or in, in the good word, um, <laughs> yeah. but I'm, I forget I'll text you after. Um, but yeah, you gotta have a vision and you have to work back from it. Um, and, and totally, I mean, like I've definitely thought I'd be the technician forever. And now I'm realizing like, okay, hey, how do I bring people in? And how do I just mentally, mentally say like, I won't be the technician in 12 months. Okay. How do I work back from that? Yeah. Um, and I think too, like you have so many people, some businesses that, um, as the entrepreneur, you're the visionary, but are you the integrator? Right. And you can yeah. be both. Like yeah. if I took, you know, I took the test. If I took yeah. the test, I'm like 98% visionary and like 89% integrator. Yeah. Right? So I can play similar roles, but what makes most sense to me is the visionary. Yeah. Right. So how do I find someone to integrate those ideas? Yeah. To make say, hey, Jim, you're, you're almost gonna step off the ledge. Let's 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 pause on that idea. Yeah. Right. Let's do that. Maybe let's talk about that in six months. We're focused on this. Yeah. And those two work together so well. But the biggest mistake I see is. You either bring in a second visionary and there's conflict on ideas mm -hmm. or you bring in someone that you think is an integrator and yeah. they're really just a technician, right? Because the technician and the integrator are two different roles Yeah. and that integrator is the leadership that's getting it done, getting it accomplished and leveraging the technician. Yeah. So I think it's so important to understand like in so many businesses I've talking to recently, it's like, okay. I'm here, I'm the entrepreneur, I'm the owner, I'm the founder. Here's the sales team. Um, but I am, I'm burnt out. Yeah. It's like, well, what system is the sales team using? Well, you know, we have a written system. It's just not working or we have a system in it. You know, they don't follow it. Yeah. Well, is the system good? Yeah. Or is the employee good or is the employee shitty? And the reality of it is, if you don't have a system, you don't have something to compare against is the employee just well, garbage. Why does this one person come in and do great? Yeah. Well, because they already are a leader. You hired a leader yeah. that's in a technician role. Yeah. 
that means that they're not even using the system you design, they're using the system that they know from prior and they're being successful. So take that leader, your top salesperson, build the sales system with them. Yeah. Have them involved so they play that leadership role because they built the system that now all the other technicians are using. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, I just go hire A players. Cool. You can hire all A players. They're going to drastically kill your profitability. Yeah. You can hire the person at 50% commission when the industry pays 30 and they're going to sell $2 million. Yeah. But you're also paying 30% on that $2 million or 50% on that $2 million. Yeah. So it's like, where's that profitability where? And that's one of the things that I've realized too, talking to a lot of business owners over the last year is like, revenue, revenue, revenue. Revenue is great. But if you don't five million in revenue and making two hundred thousand dollars in profit, you've got a shitty business. You're yeah. sorry. Yeah. If you're doing five million in revenue and making three million in profit, yeah. You must have processes in place. <laughs> That's a good business, right? Yeah. Like, so, it, and it depends, industry di is different, right? Yeah. Like markup and product or service. And, you know, there's all different metrics around it, but I just, it, it's not, it, for me at least, it's not necessarily about the revenue, yeah. right? I can do 700,000 in revenue and make 650,000 in profit. And I don't have to do 5 million in revenue. Yeah. That's going to be a lot less headache, a lot of less time, way smaller team, less yeah. to manage, less to think about, less problems, right? Because volume increases probability of, of issues and problems. Yeah. So I just think it's such a unique conversation to have because when I get into some businesses and we do that first day of like, what is your vision and how are we going to accomplish it? There's always that imbalance of like, well, I think I'm this, but based on the assessment and based on everything you told me, you're actually this. Yeah. It's not a bad thing, but we just have to identify it and how do we get it back to the reverse. Yeah. So how can I, I bring in your revenue is a great question. And I, I'd like to advise on that, but how do we bring in more profit is the real question. Yeah. yeah there's a book, uh, Profits First. Uh, a buddy of mine, also the guy that told me to read that you met a year ago. Um, just finished that and it was shooting me, you know, text back and forth, entrepreneur as well. Um, man, this is like shifted, shifted my thinking. Um, I think, I think a big part about bringing the right people on the team and, and if you read traction or anybody's read traction, they're going to relate to this thing. It's chapter five. It's a right person, right seat. Yep. And, um, that gives me comfort. I think as I do think about bringing technicians in, um, stacking them up against our core values. Um, Integrity, we keep the promises we make to ourselves and our clients. Um, grit, we operate at the intersection of um, passion and perseverance. We never give up. And, um, you know, I, I think stacking them up against those, hey, do you check these boxes, right? Um, and then the GWC that, um, that Gita Whitman talks about in traction, do they get it? Do they want it? And do they have a capacity to do it? Um, and I think that's huge. So that gives me, that definitely gives me some comfort. Um, and then a couple other like core values to, to onward of creativity. We, we address complex solutions with, um, or complex and com complex scenarios with awful solutions. Um, and, and so I, I grade those in, in a virtual assistant, every meeting that we have on Mondays, we go through our mission statement, which is to place five executive leaders across five companies because every organization deserves a leader that's going to grow them to take them to the next level. Um, so that's a little bit more on, on kind of the one year spectrum. Um, and then our overall goal in, in our purpose and our niche is, is to grow executive teams and private equity bad hydro companies so they can succeed and deliver quality care. Um, healthcare is important to a lot of people, um, especially as people's parents age and, and having quality care is important and executive leadership is what drives that. Of course. So I like it. Yeah. How did you come up with those values? Um, dude, they're iterative. They're iterative. So, um, just stuff that kind of came to mind. So I'm, I'm uh, Love Grit by Angela Duckworth. And, and it was like, it, it's basically a research study on, on why do why do some people succeed and, and why do some people fail? And uh, it didn't come down to IQ or emotional intelligence. It just came down to what she says is grit to never give up. Uh, that's been kind of a slogan for me for, for several years, um, but it's, it's that intersection of passion and perseverance and um, right at that 
kind of that that striking point is is where grit lies. Um, you've got grit. I've got grit. Uh, guys that I see that are, are not getting up and continue to push things forward. Tell her it. I love it. Um, so integrity is a big piece for me as well. Like, uh, you know, holding to the promises that you make to other people and that you make to yourself. Yeah, so I think that, that's the most important one, right? Yeah. The relationship with you, you have with yourself, the promises you make to yourself. Are you constantly negotiating with yourself? Yeah. Which is something that I fall into often. Yeah. I like to negotiate. I like the art of negotiation. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I'll have a conversation, self talk with myself, and I'll start negotiating with myself. Yeah. Well, Jim, we do this, and we'll go, well, why don't you do that? And, then, and go back and forth, you know? And it's like, well, hold on here. <laughs> I said I was going to do this. Let's just do it. Right. Yeah. Like, let's not talk myself out of it, or let's not talk myself into it. Yeah. Make the decision, run with it, and move forward. Yeah. And I was telling someone the other day, like, in business, for me, I'm not scared to run through the brick wall. Yeah. Um, I know it's going to hurt, but it's not going to kill me. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you can say, well, Jim, you just haven't ran through enough or you haven't ran through the big brick wall. And, you know, you could hit your head and it could kill you. But I'm a big guy. I can take down a lot of brick walls. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it's... from Boston. <laughs> yeah. It's like a different breed up there, man. But for me, it's like, okay, you know, um, I'm not going to die. Yeah. Like, it, like and and actually i believe that those experiences that are happening are just part of a plan yeah. to give me the insight and the knowledge and the nuggets to make better decisions moving forward if that decision did hurt yeah and those decisions you know it could hurt a lot it could hurt a little yeah. i don't know the spectrum of that pain unless i actually go and do it yeah so it, it's it's a mindset that i have that i wasn't aware of it kept popping up people kept saying but you just like you did that, you did this and, and that, like, like, dude, that's a lot of risk. And I'm like, I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still alive. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not perfect. Like there's moments of high pressure. There's moments of high stress. Yeah. Right. And you'll, you know, that just from doing what you do and now jumping into entrepreneurship, that's going to be amplified because there is no resource to go get that is a boss or a leader or a decision maker, you are the decision maker. Yeah. So you are going to make bad decisions. You are going to waste money. You are going to um, take a client that sucks that you knew a weekend that you shouldn't, shouldn't have taken, but that's all part of the process yeah. to learn, to get better, to not do that moving forward. Yeah. And I think the, one of the things that is really beneficial for solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, uh, that I found, and, and I know you have as well, is is like the mastermind function. Like, especially when you don't have a boss, no one's telling you, do that, don't do that. But honestly, I mean, it, most of all, I think uh, being an entrepreneur gets lonely. It's, it's lonely at the top. Like, that's a, that's a saying in the space, right? Um, and to having a mastermind, people you meet with on a weekly basis, monthly basis, I think weekly is probably the most beneficial. Um, there's organizations all over the place. EO, you've got masterminds. Impact Mastermind, um, you know, obviously some of these organizations that you have different stipulations on, on getting a million dollars in revenue, et cetera. Um, but there are plenty of people out there that want to see you successful and believe in you and will speak life into you. And you just need to find find that group of guys or cows or a mix of both that also have perspective um, on things in business. But also I, I the, the Mastermind that I'm part of is, is called Forged Man Collective. So, we meet weekly and uh, we discuss a you know, wide variety. There's some entrepreneurs in there. There's recent dads. There's guys that have you know gone before us a little bit. Um, you have kids, guys, uh, kids our age almost. And, and the insight and wisdom and like the speaking life into that group of people, whether it's on what we specifically talk about on a monthly basis. So we have, we call them maps. So uh, we do like this month we're talking about anger. Like how does, why do we get angry? Is it because we want to feel like we have control? Is it because we don't feel respected? We talk about around those things, um, but then it devolves into some business angles as well. And like, hey, how are you addressing this? Um, you know, in, in your business or growing or fighting these challenges? Um, and there's masterminds, I can't, you know, impact mastermind. Uh, should be something I would assume a lot of people that are listening to your stuff already are checking out, but um, that's that's huge, man. Well, it's the support system, you know, and it's the common ad, it's the common phrase of like you join a mastermind for the leader, yeah, 
but you stay in a mastermind for the community that it brings. Yeah. Right. So what attracts most people is like, oh, I'm going to learn. But a true mastermind isn't, say that I run a mastermind, a true mastermind isn't me teaching. That's a series of webinars. Yeah. Right. A series of webinars. If you sign up for an eight week mastermind, two months, and you expect me to teach in all eight of those sessions, that's more of a webinar series where a mastermind is like, no, we're going to dive into individuals and then yeah. the individuals are going to pour into the, you're the facilitator. Yeah. And, and you're, and there's, you're, a, you're there's, a, there's a guide, there's a direction, you know, I do teach in it, but it's, but it's not all teaching, right? It's like, well, Hey, I went through this and this is how I accomplished it. And blah, blah, blah. anybody going through that? You know, uh, oh, you know, I am uh, okay. Let's tell it, tell us about it, and then let's let's all collectively give advice because the people in the mastermind have been through it, haven't have a thirty thousand foot view on you, your business. Um, could be a resource like, well, my friend went through something similar. Check out this book. Check out this podcast. Right. So, it's really what it is. Is it's, it's a circle of enterprising. Yeah, and yeah. pulling the resources that are within you or that you know of to help and analyze someone's situation. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to a lot of mind, mindset, yeah. you know, um, how do you work on your mindset and how do you manage a positive, uh, mindset in, in the, in the chaos or in the storms? Yeah. Um, dude, mo most of all my relationship with Jesus is, is huge. Um, I think in marriage and professional career stuff, um, you know, our pastor had a great example the other day, but like you, you sit under the authority of God and, and I operate in that. And that's how I operate in my marriage. That's how I operate in my business and in blessings and goodness and, and all that flows through that relationship. And I think it also, and it also flows through being under that authority. Um, like I'm not the master of my destiny. Jesus is. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been huge for me. Um, and then on a, on a kind of non-spiritual level, man, it's like relationships with guys like you. Like, I'll see you at the co-working space, and um, it's it's fun to connect with you. It's, man, these are challenges. These are some wins. I'm excited about this. Um, building a community of guys that um, are pursuing bigger things than maybe just working for somebody else. Or But when you when you connect with them, you know that they're also working on, on big items, vision, goals. Um, I, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, I always say like misery loves company, yeah. and, um, and and so on, on that side, that's kind of the more um, the low, low hanging fruit joke. But um, you know, like iron sharpens iron. You know, we we kind of heard all those all those sayings. Um, but be with guys, and then also having like true meaningful relationships where you know, like we have a lot of superficial relationships. I, I people in general, like I think you and I probably do a pretty good job at at more meaningful relationships. Like um, for the amount of time that you and I hung out together, um, I feel like you're usually pretty like raw and honest, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's probably Boston in you. Um, but I am as well. Like I'm an open book. Um, I'm not like trying to you know put on a facade to most people. Um, and so having those relationships and, and being around other, other builders, I think is really important. Um, cause whatever you're going through it is 100% likely that somebody else has gone through the same thing. Oh yeah, of course. And how do you get in those spaces where, where you're meeting other guys that, that are like that. You're not going to get it by just staying at your home office and hammer out emails. It's going to be get into a positive co working space, um, go to events, go to networking events. Um, and sometimes you got shape loops. Yeah, you know, like go to a networking event that um, is at a bar, you have a drink or two, you meet great people, and you follow up with them the next day. Hey, man, it was awesome to connect. Like, I'd love to hear about your story. Let's grab coffee or Hey, you, you guys are have a boat. Like we boat as well. Let's meet up out on the lake, and then building really meaningful relationships um, that that intersect personal, you know, things that you do, personal pursuits, um, but then also like, oh, this guy's working on something. I know he's an entrepreneur. Like he gets it. He gets me. He gets where I'm at. Um, I think that's how you fight fight through it. Really, relationship with God spiritually, um, and the relationships with others that are on the same. Path. What's your process um, when you're trying? move through some negative stuff is that more like hey i'm gonna take a step back and go pray or is that it's like i'm gonna go reach out to a friend and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation i'm curious because yeah i've been asking this question a lot over the last couple of weeks and the the answers are so different yeah like of course everybody's like well you know i i 
I'm thinking negative or have the stinking thinking or whatever, then yeah. I just put myself around something positive, right? So like I get that piece of it, but what that something positive is, is so drastically different. Yeah. Um, me, I mean, I, I, uh, I start my mornings out in the word, which is, which is huge. And I think that just kind of builds, builds the day. Dude, there's some days that I'm a horrible Christian. Like I'm horrible to people. I have a horrible attitude. I don't treat my wife well. I have negative thoughts, um, but to to your point, on the good days, what does it look like, right? Um, and on the good days, it's like confiding in my wife, like, gosh, man, this is really this is really frustrating. Um, or it's connecting with guys in the mastermind. Um, you know, we have a we have a signal thread. I would assume you have something kind of similar to connect everybody, and, um, and and then it's also like how leveraging like falling back on your core values. So for my core values, um, it's it's okay, grit. Like how am I gonna approach this with grit? I say that's a core value to me, but but how am I just gonna never give up? Yeah. Um, and and so I think there's you know to, to all things there's elements of, of personal, spiritual, physical, um, you know kind of the physical. Um, um, I'm totally blanking on the the triangle there, but anyways, like physical, emotional, um, and spiritual, like that kind of triangle. So um, lining things up spiritually, lining things up physically, like. Sometimes you just need to get a cup of coffee or a little pre-workout and you got to go throw some weights around yeah. um, and, and the endorphins and like the natural process in your body to, to kind of right size your thinking. Um, that's, that's definitely a piece of it for sure. I kind of navigate those things. Yeah. I don't have a sauna like you or else I go steam it up. Um, but uh, well, yeah, that's, 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 that's my, you know, it's, it's people are like, oh, sauna, this and that and the health benefits. I'm like, yeah, totally. But like. The sauna for me is solitude. Yeah. My day is typically chaos, meaning controlled chaos, right? But like this person picked me up, this person called on this person, voice bill, text message, Zoom meeting, event, speaking gig, webinar. Um, you know, so it's 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 drastically complex. Yeah. But I do a really bad job at spending a lot of time. And I know what it stems from. It stems from trauma as a mm. child, right? And, you know, parents, you know, not necessarily being there. So going and always positioning myself around friends and as my true family, right? So I know what it stems from, but I still struggle with it at age 34. Yeah. And I have to set up certain sequences within my day to have that alone time. So the sauna for me is like a double win because I'm sweating, I'm getting the red light. <laughs> Right, but the physical is there, but also it is that alone time yeah. to actually think about, okay, what is the strategy? What do I like about my life? What am I struggling with? What resources do I need? What resources do I have? And then also, you know, grabbing 15, 20 pages of a book in that process, yeah. to then get my mind in a positive and inspired mode yeah. to then move through it. And not every day is like that, right? Yeah. And not every day is, is a complex, um, while I have a lot of heavy pressure, but that level of consistency, which I fell off for a while, yeah. right? And like, then it's like, well, why am I aggravated? Why am I more frustrated? Why? Okay, I'm um, <laughs> missing something that was super beneficial to me that I anticipated and expected. Yeah, gratefulness, man. Like, I think that's a big piece of it too. That's kind of the other the other aspect of like fighting negative emotions, fighting let downs. Um, gratefulness. Wow! Look at everything that I have. I've got a beautiful wife. Got a beautiful kid. Um, people in my life love me. Um, I'm surrounded by people that believe in me. Um, I, I feel like that's a big, big, big piece. It's, it's just gratefulness. So you have to fight negative thing, and then never give up. I'm never going to give up. Yep. So um, the uh, great poet philosopher Alex Ramosi says, um, "You cannot fail if you don't give up." And so that's that's very much so that mentality like uh exists between the you know the david goggins just like crush through it you know followed by expletives um i love that i love that guy and, and that's that's a mindset and that's a mentality to have uh, i i'm a big believer in just like never never take someone 100 percent. like i don't think you should just blindly follow anybody because it should be your own iteration of what you're consuming uh, but i think consuming positive content consuming uh things from people that have gone before you totally the same challenges is how it sets, how you set it up. And guys that like don't read, don't do podcasts, don't have intentional community through masterminds, um, 
for me, obviously like church and, and spiritual stuff's big. Like, you if I didn't have those things, I don't know how people, and the majority, we're outliers. We're outliers. Most people aren't doing what we're doing or, or are doing what you like. I think he, I mean, you know what the resource is at that point. Yeah. Porn, yeah. excess of alcohol, drugs, yeah. um, broken relationships, right? Like I, I live that. Yeah. I've done that, right? Yeah. I'm not speaking out of school here yeah. or pointing my finger at anybody. Yeah. Because that was me. Yeah. Um, but until I actually realized like, wow, okay, I'm just suppressing a lot of this with these outlets yeah. rather than utilizing outlets that enhance, yeah. right? And get me out of my own way. Yeah. Those outlets of alcohol, excessive alcohol, drugs, you know, party, whatever you want to call it, doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. It just mitigates dealing with it in that real time. Yeah. And I'm not saying you shouldn't drink alcohol. I'm not saying you shouldn't use cannabis. Like do you, do whatever. Um, because everybody has their own battle with it and whatnot. But like, for me, it was like nicotine, vape pen, and stressed out selling 60 houses a year. Yeah. Because nicotine was an upper for me. It was never yeah. a relaxation point for me. So, you know, now it's like, well, I can go smoke a cigar. Yeah. And that's completely different than hitting this thing 7,000 thousand hits <laughs> a week. Yeah. Right, and using it when I'm tired to gain energy. Yeah. Now I, someone's like, well, Jim, you, you smoke cigars, and I'm like, but a cigar is a relaxation for me. Yeah. A cigar is a, is a social experience. Yep. You don't see me ripping five cigars a week out back by uh -huh. myself. I thought I saw some butts out <laughs> <laughs> But like the reality of it is, is I'm aware and I know how to use it and use it to my advantage, not necessarily to my detriment of suppressing or, you know, using it as a stepping stone to get to somewhere else. It's more like, hey, yeah, let's go have a cigar and have a great business life conversation yeah. and enjoy it in a relaxed setting and have an experience to remember rather than me up at 10 o'clock at night whacking this fucking strawberry banana delicious <laughs> nicotine yeah. 7,000 times before I go to bed to stay yeah. up. Yeah. Like that's, that's using it as a drug in my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's just a variance of how you use it and, and what can you replace those things with and identify and have the self-awareness, you know, yeah. it wasn't a problem until it was a problem. Well, it wasn't a problem until I'm like, dude, I, I grew up hating my parents for smoking cigarettes in the car. But yet here I am ripping a nicotine pen. Like I'm the ultimate hypocrite. Yeah. I can't be mad at them because I'm using the same thing that they're using to de-stress. It just smells better, but it's still top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's just like, how do I position myself in those situations and scenarios to do the things that actually enhance yeah. with the people that are actually going to be in the community and help? and be part of that solution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you got good relationships. You got relationships like this, you know? Yeah. Um, people that people that bring you up, uh, bring you down. So they, it's a big piece of it. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because when you do different things, and in my experience, doing bigger things and taking bigger risk, you flood out those people that were never supporters anyways. It comes a lot, it comes to fruition very quick, yeah. and very visible, very fast. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, why is that person, you know, why, why, is it, why is that person talking shit about me? Well, I'm not like, actually think about it. Spent time going through some memories. They actually never supported me. Mm -hmm. I actually just thought they did because we hung out. Yeah. But if I actually look back at those people, I'm like, they never supported me. Yeah. You know, like, and it's usually the person when I was drinking, it's usually the person that I look back and I'm like, they never bought me a fucking drink one time. I used to <laughs> buy them shots every time I went out drinking. Yeah. That can be just that little, I see it through a different lens now because they dropped off and they're talking shit. And it's like, they never were really a friend. They never really were my support staff. They were just someone to go have drinks with and hang out and enjoy a new bar or concert in Nashville. Yeah. So it's just an interesting transition as you play bigger, do more, and surround yourself with people who actually care. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. And I think uh, I think going out and, and putting yourself in places that make you a little uncomfortable are huge. I'm not always. I'm usually always pretty on, but but there's been times. Honestly, some of, interestingly enough, some of the best relationships. Like, like I can put my finger on it. Uh, came from events where I was dreading walking in. Yeah, it's always that, dude. Um, and in big placements, relationships that turned into clients um, were were events where I was like, oh, man, like I'd rather be home. And and, and there's always a balance. Well, you are of, home. Yeah. And you're like, all right, I came home, and now I got to drive back downtown in traffic. Yeah. Ugh, I can just enjoy dinner with my wife and daughter and. Yeah, it'll be fine. But you get up and you go and you show up. Yeah, that's been a lot of what I've been talking about. Like, just show up. Yeah. Because here's the thing: if I show up and the event sucks, yeah, I can turn around and walk out the door. Yeah. And, and what did I lose? Up. An hour of my time. But what if that? Uh, what if I walk in and that event changed my life? That person changed my life. I met my best friend. I met someone who aligns with my wife and they become friends. I meet yeah. someone that I do a business deal with. They refer me to a $50,000 contract, whatever that is. Let's, let's show up and, and see where that takes us. Because at the end of the day, yeah, it sucks. You may drill 40 minutes there, 40 minutes back, but you can also throw a podcast on. Yeah. It's not a total loss. You this can podcast. also call a friend. Yeah. You can check in on people. Like you can use that time strategically to where it's not a loss for that commute. Yeah. And I think that's just such a powerful thing of, of exactly what you're saying. Like, dude, I would go, I've gone to so many things and I'm like, just show up, just show up. And I've gone in and have met someone that has literally changed my life. Yeah. And I've even done it to the point where I didn't even get someone's contact information, but the conversation for 22 minutes of that event changed my life. Yeah. When I've never seen that person again, talked to that person again, couldn't find them on LinkedIn, nothing, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was exactly what I needed at the time. Maybe I didn't need a new friend. Maybe, maybe they wouldn't be able to help me in the future or there wasn't true alignment, but in that one moment there was, yeah. and it was super powerful. Yeah. And I, and I think, being a leader and, and having a voice and having um, influence in the space too, in, in your space, in the space that I'm in, uh, it's oftentimes you can, when you're on, when you're on it, um, you can be that person that like sees somebody that you know needs like life spoken into them or a relationship or kindness. And uh, I think that, that goes really far. Um, I believe in, I believe in also like from a networking perspective, um, probably two or three things. So like, I always believe in, in looking for like the low hanging fruit. Um, so I'm part of different organizations, nonprofit organizations, some, some networking organizations, and I believe the low hanging fruit is, is a member list. And you pull whatever organization you're part of, pull that member list down, identify either by, you know, kind of um, cross-referencing them on a LinkedIn platform or even at the end of their um, email signature, like, hey, would this person be worth setting up 30, 45 minutes over, over coffee? I love in-person stuff. I try not to do virtual things very often. Um, could could I help them? Could they help me? Could we build a relationship that's meaningful? Um, so that, I firmly believe in, uh, in in when you're leaving an event, and my, my wife, I always show up late when I'm like, I'll be home at six, and I'm home at seven, because uh, I do this often, but like, meet one more person. Like, you're like, all right, I'm out of here. Um, but like, how can you meet one more person? And it's like, hey dude, I love that blazer. Like, what's your name? Okay, awesome, it was good to meet you. I'm headed out, gotta like get home for, for dinner, get home for bedtime, uh, which as a dad and a, a parent, anybody's like, oh dude, I like, that's the best part of the day. Go. But yeah, go, <laughs> go, but like, hey, can There's I There's alignment your... right there after like, all right, no, you need to go. Yeah, yeah. Rather than like, well, hold on, let's have a 15 minute conversation. It's like, yeah. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, like have an excuse, have an excuse, um, but like meet just that one extra person. Yeah, um, I think I think that's that's super big. And then, as far as networking goes, you are if you do have a voice in the space or you want to have a voice in the space, where can you create value? Um, so for me, it's hey, how can I get a bunch of private equity, investment banking guys and gals into a room? And I, I found my niche, right? Like I found. I enjoy cigars. Um, I like bourbon. I drink super, super often. But like I know a little bit about it, right? Um, so how can I take things that I enjoy 
and then create an event around them, drive value, invite people, connect people, um, and grow my network, but also grow other people's networks. Sure. And what goes around comes around, and uh, and, and when they're thinking, and I need to find an executive leader for, for this new portfolio company we just bought. It's like, you know who's always like, putting the best foot forward, super kind, always introducing me, has a great network, has a voice in the space, like, yeah, Travis is always, you know, we should reach out, we should reach out to Travis. Um, or, you know, I'm trying to start my business and I've been networking, I've gone to these impact events, but like, I feel like I need a, a network of guys and gals that are pursuing like excellence. And I want someone like that I could look up to and facilitate that. And like, and Jim's always doing impact events. And he's got a mastermind, like I should reach out to Jim. Or even the best man is when it's like a cold outreach. Someone's like, hey, I was having a coffee with, you know, Kurt. And uh, Kurt said you have a mastermind, Jim, and, and he said that, that he's been in it or uh, that I should reach out to you. And, uh, and you're like, dude, yes. Yeah. Like, sweet. Inbound leads are always awesome. <laughs> uh, but I love that too. In my business, someone shoots me a message on LinkedIn, never talked to him before. Yeah, my buddy Dave said that, that you're the guy, or that you're really well networked. Uh, it feels good for guys like us that, that often work in the dark of developing a brand and building things. You're like, does anybody like this? Does anybody, is anybody catching on to this? Uh, and then you get those like little affirmations that, that you're making a difference, you drive difference and you're driving value. And so, like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, there's, there, dude, there's just like too many guys that are complacent. Too many guys and gals. Um, but I think the intentionality of, of masterminds and like getting around people that are pursuing big things, it's like so important. Well, it's scary. I think that's why the complacency exists. It's scary of them. Yeah. It's fair, fear, failure, resource, right? So like mm -hmm. you have the fear of failing, so you never do it. Yeah. Then you do it and you fail and you never do it again. Then you get through the fear, you fail, and then you realize, okay, I just need more resources. Yeah. And then that's the cycle. It's like once you get to that enterprising state of like, okay, I learned I'm not an idiot, I'm not a loser, I'm not a failure, but now I just need more resource. Yeah. You know, and I think that when you get to that point, it's like, I'm unstoppable. Yeah. If I'm a good person and I want to help people and provide value, people will help me. Yes. And that's just a unifying bond of love. And I think that that's the unifying bond of the world. Yeah. Because we all want love. Yeah. We all want to give love. We don't want to feel love. Yeah. Now we're just breaking it down into a business sector. That's all it is. Yeah. I love people, so I'm going to help people. I'm going to help the struggling entrepreneur, even though that struggling entrepreneur will never pay me a dollar. Right, but I'm gonna get on a call on a Saturday for 30 minutes because they've got six coaches and they're doing spending zero amount of their time doing revenue producing activities. Yeah, not saying fire the coach. Not saying I'm better. I'm just gonna help you yeah. because you need to pay your mortgage next month. So let's figure out how much time you're allocating to produce revenue. Yeah, and in most of those cases, it's the same conversation. Yeah, we spend 30 minutes a day on Instagram. Is your clients on Instagram? Are you speaking to me right now? <laughs> well, I do it too. Yeah. I mean, we're all victim of it, right? And yeah. for me, it's not. None of my clients come from Instagram. Now, when I was doing real estate a lot, yeah. Yeah. Right? Because that's more social platform, and I'm posting this deal and that, and they're curious, and they're asking, oh, that's a nice house, and where is that? And blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Yeah. But on a consulting standpoint, the people that hire me aren't seeing on Instagram. They may have a personal brand yeah. after they've exited for multi-million dollars. That's not my client either, right? I'm not going to consult someone that's in that $10 million business to 50 million. That's not my, that's not what I do. Yeah. I don't have those systems built. I've never had to build. Yeah. So how can I do that and show up where people are in that moment where I can actually help them get to that one to five million mark? Yeah. And leading with value, I think that's a... But Instagram's fun as hell. It, I love Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Best social media platform. Um, actually, LinkedIn, man. I mean, LinkedIn has been where I built uh, a bit of a personal brand. And um, it, it's a ton of fun. I love relationships. Like I love meeting people. I love learning how to help people. Um, so it's, good. it's a good platform for me. Um, but just leading with value, too. I know, sure. like, what, what you're talking about, providing free resources. I think the person that smashes it, and I, I would assume to some degree, uh, we all want to, we all want to maybe look like him. I don't need as a lot of steroids, but, 
Uh, and he's opened by uh, Alex Ormosi, not Liver King. Um, but Alex Ormosi, dude, just freaking leads with value. Like, free stuff, free stuff, free stuff. Here's my book for $1.99. Um, I didn't, you know, he doesn't, didn't publish it with anybody because he wanted the ability to give it away for free. You don't want a publishing company being like, no, 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 you have to sell for, the minimum is $10, right? Um, the guys that put their books on their own podcast, I freaking love. Uh, Alex Ormos, he's got his on um, his podcast. And he yeah. reads them, reads them. Um, and, and because he just wants people to have access to it. And he just knows that like, what goes well, It's around. also strategic too. Yeah. He oh, wants you to blow up your company so he can buy it. Yeah. That's so, awesome. And you're going to a great money. model. You have an exit. He makes money. He's doing a billion dollar thing. Yeah. It's um, a great model because I don't think he's giving the value just for you to grow so he can buy your company or acquire it. I think he's giving the value because he cares, but it's also perfectly in line with his business plan. Yeah. Right. Dude, he has mouse speed. You have mouse speed. Like at some point, at some point you can't provide more free info and it's like, hey, join the mastermind. Like yeah. I've kind of maxed out the value I could deliver you here over calls or coffees or whatever, but like, I think, I think it'd be a great fit for the mastermind, right? Well, I think that's the, the difference of, <laughs> I was talking about this at a dinner last night with <clears throat> Jamie Miller and Nicole Kramer and Neil Flora. We had a four and a half hour dinner. I saw it. It felt like 30 minutes. Like it was just such a deep conversation in all life aspects. How many texts did you have from your wife? I, <laughs> <laughs> she's like, take the dogs out when you get home. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, you, know, you know that means she's like, Shut the door. Yeah. She's asleep. Yeah. Baby's asleep. Don't bother me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but don't come in looking for it either. Yeah. You know, yeah. that that's a telltale side. It's like eight o'clock. I, I tell my wife, we have a joke that she turns into a pumpkin yeah. after eight. Yeah. So, um, yeah, probably too much. But dude, that's life. But <laughs> to that point, it's like, we're talking about, you can read the books, you can listen to the podcasts. But what you can't do in those situations is ask the question in real time based on how you downloaded the information so that affects good. you and your business in that moment, in that stage, in that experience that you're in right now in your business. Yeah. That takes a conversation. Yeah. And people are, you know, just, and we, I see this at my events. They come to the event, they bought the conference ticket, they get the free ticket for the next couple. They're going to come, they're going to learn. They're never going to actually ask the real questions to move the needle mm. and they're going to leave and they're not going to practice what they learned because they don't know, actually know how to apply it. Yep. And so what I did was I started doing an hour Q and a session. Okay. You would think a hundred hands go up. It's like four or five people ask questions in one hour, quick, one hour. Anybody can ask a question. We'll dive right into the, about four or five people every time. Mm. So it's like, a lot of people are just going to come to take the photo for Instagram. A lot of people are going to come shake the hand to build the relationship, but you're not building the relationship because you're not providing value. You're obtaining the value yeah. and you're not going deeper because of whatever limiting beliefs you have. Yeah. This is a rip off or I can't pay you this or the money. I don't have the money. Like we were talking last night. It's like, you know how many times I didn't have the money? but fucking found it mm -hmm. yeah. and that session or that strategy or that plan or that process changed my business and then I made more money and then paid off that credit card. Isn't entrepreneurship on like the verge of like, I can't afford this. Okay. I'm going to choose to move the needle this direction. Then you see the upside and then you're ready for the next level and you're like, okay, I'm pretty tight again. Am I going to make this happen? Okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to show up. Um, but that's, that's life. Who's got the promo code? <laughs> like, that's life though. Yeah. Like, like if you think you're going to make a million dollars every single year because you made a million dollars this year, you're fucking high. Yeah. It's not reality. Yeah. It just doesn't happen like that. Like there's seasons, there's ups and downs, there's peaks and valleys. And, and the reality of it is, is you've got to be okay with that. Yeah. And that's where I've struggled with in entrepreneurship, right? Like, Started a company, we crushed it. I thought I was at the top, COVID hit, I lost it. Started a consulting company in 2020, business partner was scared of what was happening in 2020, wanted to go back to corporate. Had to close that business. Had the event company, was working, almost shut it down, and realized that he could transition and pivot it, right? Sold the, the, the frozen beverage company, did real estate, that was great. Realized I wasn't impacting enough people, consulting again, throwing yeah. different types of events. 
working with different types of clients and it's like that's peaks and valleys yeah. right 500k a year 200k 100k yeah 600k 700k 80k like yeah but that's the thing and you know, it's like you know life is ups and downs and like when it's when it's good it's good but you know that good never consists like this look at actors look at artists look at musicians the ones that that are okay with this sustain yeah. the ones that fall off become drowning out it's overdose and die yeah. because they're, they're they're they can't sustain the lows because they're on the highs yeah but perfection is not real this doesn't happen yeah right and like you can see someone who's crushing it but where are they now yeah you know and it's like well do they still have a good family? Yes, they're still married. They're still involved in their kids' life. All that great stuff. So that tells me, like, well, money didn't destroy them. Yeah. Because that J. Cole album that dropped five years ago, right? Yeah. Dude made millions. What's he doing now? He's not making that money that he used to make. Yeah. Well, George, uh, sometimes you're flush. Sometimes you're bust. <laughs> And when you're up, it feels like you're never going to be down. When you're down, it feels like you're never going to be up. But life goes on. My fa- one of my favorite Dude, quotes, my bro. Favorite lines. Um, yeah, Money's not ro- real, Georgie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we were talking about that. Like, 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 I posted the ago. quote. You we were Dude. going back and forth on Instagram. Yeah. 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 Um, Dude, that's great. That's great. Yeah. My wife still hasn't seen that. Anyways. I'm going to yeah. drop a reel about that. The money is, is it real quote. Yeah. I shot one last week and uh, I just got it back the other day. So you'll probably yeah. see it come out on yeah. I'll re- social. I'll reshare it. Um, well, dude, this was yeah. fun, man. We got to do this again, bro. Yeah. 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 I, it's always, I, I feel like you're one of the guys in my life that's like real, shoots you like straight. You're doing big things. Appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see impact continue to grow. And like, and, and, I mean, I even think of, of just what we chose to call our businesses, impact, like onward, onward. I mean, like these are clear and they're all caps, which I love. Yes. Um, <laughs> but like we're doing, we're doing things that we want to deliver value. We want to change people's lives. And like, I want to surround myself with more guys like that. Um, you know, if it looks like guys that I compete with directly, but they're doing big things and they want to grow stuff like, Hey, how do we, how do we create a network? Misery loves company. You know, how, how do we combine our, our forces or even just our thought processes and just that abundance outlook of like yeah you know jamie miller and i were talking last night and, and you know he's like i have an abundance mentality he's like i think you should incorporate some of what i teach yeah to your people more often i'll okay. help you build that course J- jamie miller he's killer like what you know how many people are like you can't sit me inside of my business or you can't and like jamie's over here like i think you should you have something similar in your repertoire of what you do. That's what I do. Yeah. And you should help people with that and I'll help you build it. Yeah. And it's like, and that you paid for my dinner last night. Class act, right? Like that's awesome. she was helping me. He's speaking to my community. He's yeah. flying to Nashville, you know? And it's like, and he takes me out to dinner yeah. and wants to help me. Like that just tells you that, there is people out there and how do we find them and how do we align with them? Yeah. You know, and someone like that is, 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 is rare. Yeah. It's very rare. I, uh, I'll leave you with this cause I know, I know we got all sorts of things going on today, but, uh, the, uh, 10 actual by Grant Cardone, love him or hate him. Um, one of, one of those points in there is one person's success doesn't reduce the amount of success that you can have. Um, and man, that totally shifted my thinking probably three years ago. And then all of a sudden I started connecting, trying to build relationships with guys that were recruiting accounting and finance people in Nashville and across the country. And I, I would say two of those guys are, are two of my closest relationships and we sort of competed, but like uh, on the macro level, you know, like, oh man, you guys must compete all the time on the micro level is like, maybe we were sharing a, a search every three months. Yeah. Maybe, but it's also what attracts someone to you is different than what attracts someone to him or her. Totally. So it's like, you know, you sit at a table last night with four people who help people grow revenue and sales. And we had a very open conversation about our businesses, how much money we're making, 
what our goals are, why we do it, how we do it. There was no competition at that table yeah. because it was the right people at the table. Yeah. And that's when you get to have those deep, high, high, high level conversations because we're yeah. all in abundance. It's like, what you say is, a, is great, I'll, I'll use that. Yeah. But like, that's not my whole business. And I don't yeah. say it like you say it. Yeah. And the story I tell behind it is a completely different story than how you would bring it up when you still, when you tell a story around why it's important. Yeah. So it's like, and then it, and then it was great because we all realized yeah. like, we're all repeating the same stuff. Yeah. Just the, the uniqueness is why someone wants to hear it from me rather than hear it from you. Why someone yeah. wants to work with me rather than work with you. Yeah. And it's just that a level of alignment. They yeah. may align with a male. They may align with a female. Yeah. Those are two different energies, feminine energy and masculine energy. Yeah. That right there could be the decision maker. Yeah. I'm masculine. I'm an alpha. I'm very direct. People may not like that. Yeah. They may want to work with a female. They may want to work with another male that isn't as direct and waters it down a little bit. We can teach the same thing. We can help. We can get the same results. Yeah. But there's a different approach to it. And understanding that and being able to just have a deep conversation and put it all out there in full vulnerability and talk about parents and life and trauma and kids and work and frustrations and you know losses and failures and wins and it's like four and a half hours later like well, I'm yawning it's 11 30 yeah. I gotta, we gotta go home right yeah. but it's like those situations are just so important to realize because it's it's that abundance mentality. Yeah. It's that, well, we're all doing similar stuff, but we're all drastically different human beings. And that's the great part about humanity. Yeah. Right. It's a fingerprint for a reason. Yeah. There's not one that's the same. Like that's, that's the smallest minute example of who we are as individuals. Yeah. So I'm with you, man. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful day. 2024 is going to be the uh, best that we've ever had. Excited to so your business, man. Good. Awesome, man. I appreciate you. Or to support me on and, and have a conversation. And this felt like staying at the EC, shooting the shit. I love it. So. Thanks, for Awesome. Thanks for coming, bro. Yeah, man. Appreciate it.